following is a presentation of KSL Sports. Hello, Cougar Nation. Who's open for three? Angle left takes it and makes it. Fuseni Traore. And listen to the Cougar Nation. Every Monday night, we break down the last week of BYU basketball and look ahead to the Cougars' prospects for the postseason. Cougar Nation. Here's BYU insider Mitch Harper and Matt Miamonte on Utah's legacy home of the Cougars. KSL News Radio. Good evening, Cougar Nation. Welcome on into your show, Cougar Nation, every single Monday night here on your legacy home of the Cougars, KSL News Radio. I'm Mitch Harper, joined as always with Matt Biamonte. We host this show and also Cougar Sports Saturday every weekend, noon to three here on KSL. So much to get to in the world of BYU basketball. Cougars fall at Kansas State, but they got another Sunflower State showdown tomorrow night at historic Allen Fieldhouse as the unranked BYU Cougars take on number seven Kansas. We'll break that down and we'll take your phone calls, 801 575 8255. But we got to start things off, Matt, with that BYU Kansas State game. A disappointing effort in Manhattan as BYU falls 84 to 74. Yeah, it was disappointing, Mitch, because this Kansas State team had been losing a lot of games prior to BYU going out to Manhattan, Kansas. And it was disappointing to see them kind of come back down to earth after such a big win against Baylor. Let's get to the takeaways from that 10 point loss over the weekend. Cougar Nation takeaways. Mitch and Matt analyze BYU's last week of play and what it means for the next week. K-State 84, BYU 74, as Matt noted. Kansas State was reeling. I mean, they only won one game in their last six, and they took down BYU. And takeaway number one, Matt, slow start and poor three-point shooting was ultimately the downfall before BYU could catch their breath. They were down 12-2, to two, and they shot 19% from three. Six of 31, Mitch, and that comes after a great three-point shooting performance in a win against Baylor where you knocked down 14 threes. We talked about that a week ago. They had to make threes to upset Baylor. They did that, and then it was just a completely different team performance on the road against Kansas State. And you look at the box score – BYU beat Kansas State in a lot of areas. Less turnovers, more rebounds, more points in the paint, more bench points. But when you shoot that poorly from three, and then they fouled a lot as well, that put Kansas State in the, on the free throw line, plus 13 there for K-State. Too much to overcome on the road. 801-575-8255. You can get on board with us, share your thoughts on this Kansas State loss, or also get involved in our question of the day. What needs to happen for BYU to upset Kansas? We'll preview that BYU-Kansas game a little bit later in the show. 801-575-8255. But yeah, that slow start was disappointing. On the heels of a big win over Baylor, you thought BYU would be a little bit more lively, a little more energetic, because honestly, Kansas State's season was on the ropes in that game on Saturday. And Tyler Perry, who was shooting 17% from three in his last three games prior to BYU, comes out and bangs the first two three-point attempts. You just could tell it was one of those days for BYU. I thought BYU's offense looked looked good. I thought they were getting good shots. They just couldn't knock them down. And at some point, BYU has to find a way to knock down the three ball away from the Marriott Center because they'll be an early exit in the NCAA tournament. They will be an early exit in the Big 12 tournament if they can't hit the three. I know it's cliche, live and die by the three, but it really does feel that way with BYU because – They don't have the star power. At no point in this season in the Big 12 has BYU pulled down player of the week, newcomer of the week recognition. They don't have that elite star. It's it's a group by committee that's lifted up by three-point shooting. And if you knock down only 19%, you're going to lose to anyone, regardless if you're at home or not, especially in this league. Because takeaway number two, Kansas State's Arthur Kaluma is, He is becoming the BYU killer. This guy was once at Creighton. He had a career high with Creighton, 27 points against BYU in Vegas last year. On Saturday, he puts up another career high, 28 points, and joins the list of guys that always rise to the occasion against BYU. And he went to the free throw line a lot, Mitch, 12 times. He makes 10 of 12, double-double for Kaluma and head coach Mark Pope was complimentary of his play because, like you said, man, he just keeps killing BYU whenever he plays them. Well, he's a really talented player. He's really, he was great getting the free throw line tonight. He shot the ball great from the three-point line. 
Uh, he's really physical and explosive. He can extend the play with Euro steps and extra steps. And, um, he's a terrific player. They got to find a way, though, to stop some of these terrific players. They're going to be playing some terrific players tomorrow against Kansas. And again, we'll get to that preview in a little bit. But defensively, Mitch, I I felt like there was a little uh, a little something there to be desired defensively. I I know that they didn't shoot the ball well, but they gave up 42 points in each half. And Kaluma was a big part of that. Don't get me wrong; he, he played great basketball. But this team on the road, defensively, it feels like they're just not the same group as they are at home. There was a stretch in the second half where Kansas State went a little bit cold, and they had a four-minute drought without a field goal attempt or field goal make, excuse me. And yet, Kansas State, despite that lull, built their lead from about seven to I believe it was twelve, and that was the game. And I remember that was a stretch that included. BYU had three looks at the basket. It was around the under-12 media timeout, and Dallin Hall missed one, and then Richie Saunders gets called for an over-the-back foul, and you could just tell Dallin Hall's body language. He hunches over and just out of frustration, and you could just tell it wasn't BYU's day. And, yep. you know, I understand there's a case of, well, it's the Big 12, it's tough winning on the road, but, you know, at one point you were viewed as, you know, a top-25 team. You're now not ranked. And you just beat Baylor. At some point, you got to break through on the road. You know, if you're going to be a team that gets to the second weekend of the dance, and I know it's we're recalibrating our expectations of this BYU team because had you told us at the beginning of the season seven and seven heading into the final four games of league play, you would have said absolutely, I'm taking that. But when you get to the heights of being number twelve in the AP poll, when you're a top fifteen team in the net the entire year. You know, the, the bar raises a bit, and you got to play at a higher standard, and BYU is just not getting the necessary stops on the defensive end, and that's takeaway number three. BYU's defense is not traveling on the road. You know, that first meeting against Kansas State back on February 10th, BYU comes out of that game. They were number 24 nationally in adjusted defensive efficiency. It's kind of a, a defensive metric to, to rank the best defenses in college basketball. Since that game, they're allowing 84 points per contest. They're down to number 68 nationally. BYU's defense is plummeting fast, and that's worrisome as we get to tournament season for BYU. they got to get some answers soon in a hurry, Matt, on the defensive end. And it's four straight games, Mitch, where they're giving up at least 50% from the, from the field, just from the field, field goal percentage. Kansas State shoots 56% from the field and you touched on it with a lot of missed gimmies and this has been a trend for weeks now where they're just missing layups the opponents aren't missing layups and at some point defensively you've got to find a way to string together a lot of stops and and look even though they held Kansas State for at least four minutes with no field goals in the second half the Wildcats still pour on 42 points it's just the thing is if you can't shoot the three ball consistently, like, and they have not done so in Big 12 play. In non-conference play, they were consistently one of the best three-point shooting teams in the country. It's been an up and down in conference play, Mitch. And, and that's fine. That's somewhat to be expected, especially in a conference like the Big 12 that has very difficult places to play, which they'll find out tomorrow, right? Allen Fieldhouse, Texas Tech is hard. Iowa State, which is still to come for BYU. That place is hard. There's hard places to play. You can't always rely on three-point shooting, but you hope to be able to rely on defense because that it feels so often it's effort-based, it's executing the scheme, and there's too many lapses that make it difficult to win games when your shooting is not hot like it's been in some of the wins. And what's discouraging, too, is that in this recent dip on the defensive end, it's been with their full collection of personnel. You know, Ali yep. Khalifa's been back. Noah Waterman's back from the illness. You know, everyone's back that's contributing. Now, I know you don't have Dawson Baker and, and Marcus Adams, but uh, everyone that you were expecting to be in this rotation that got you to the heights that you were at, you know, in, in January, uh, they are there. And so this is the healthiest they've been in a while, and they're having these defensive lapses. And, you know, the offensive shooting, 19% from three, was a problem, but Mark Pope, he you know did not blame the offense. He focused more on the defense and the loss. We did not shoot the ball well tonight. Yeah, that's never a defining feature for us, winning or losing. You know, we offset that with the 19 offensive rebounds, and so I was, I was really pleased with our guys' effort. One of those nights in the Big 12, it's hard. The offensive rebounding was a positive for BYU. They finished 
with 19 offensive boards, but they only had 14 second chance yep. points on those offensive rebounds. And look, you can look at the offensive rebound stat and say, well, you're bricking, you're missing, you're clanking on a lot of shots. So it's creating these opportunities for offensive rebounds. Uh, but when you get those chances, you got to capitalize. And BYU just couldn't finish those second chance opportunities. And that's probably something that's maybe a bit under the radar right now. I know you've touched on this a lot, Mitch. So, so credit to you for pointing this out frequently. But it's just it's a broken record now. How many missed layups there are, and and they're they're coming at such horrible times. That sequence you mentioned in the second half, where Down Hall gets a layup, Kansas State's on a drought. Maybe that gets you going. Instead, it just piles onto the frustration. We've talked about this before in Cougar Nation. The problem with missing these gimmies is it affects the other end of the floor. Because you can noticeably see the frustration on the players' faces, their body language, and then the same intensity is not there on the defensive end. And it's just this cycle that BYU finds themselves in on the road repeatedly where these things happen. They can't get out of their own way when it comes to those gimmies at the rim. And it's it's painful to miss those because this team is so reliant on the three-point line. When you get an easy look, you got to convert that because – there's not a lot of easy looks by design because this offense wants to be a far away from the rim. One of the bright spots, though, from the loss was Spencer Johnson becoming a dad, which yep. cra- c- congrats to him and his wife, Izzy. And that's where we shift our attention now as we go out to the phone line. And 801-575-8255, our favorite caller on the program, Linda. She joins us now. Do you have some thoughts on Spencer Johnson becoming a dad, Linda? Yes, I sure do. I'm really happy for him and Izzy. I was wondering when, if it was going to come early, you know, if he was going to come early, the baby. And I thought it was so neat because I listened to the coach's show on Thursday night, too. And that's how I originally found out about it. And it was so funny because uh, Coach Pope accidentally gave out the the labor and delivery room. And (laughs) and then he says, why do I always do those things anyway? And it was kind of funny, but um, but I'm really happy for him. And the, I guess uh, from then I heard after the game on Saturday, um, Coach Pope said that they were going to fly home and that they were go- going to go visit um, Spencer and his wife and the baby. And and so um, and then they were going to travel today. So, but I thought that was really nice, though, that they could go and see the baby and go home for that and not have to stay on the road any longer than they had to. Thanks for the call. Been... Thanks for the call, Linda. We, we appreciate that. Yeah, that, that was that was pretty cool with Spence being able to become a dad. On it was His, his little baby, Joey Johnson, was born Thursday night, uh, 2.22 p.m. It was cool. I was watching during practice, and I was kind of in the upper deck of, of practice, and I saw uh, Nate Austin, the director, director of basketball operations, he got his phone and he turns to Coach Pope and looks at his phone and says, you know, he indicates something. I couldn't tell what exactly what it was. And he and then Mark Pope gets the team together and kind of rallies everyone together. And Spence is on the phone on FaceTime and he sh- told the team that he was a dad. Him and Izzy had the baby and, and they all cheered in that moment. And then Coach Pope said, let's get back to practice or something along those. I can't remember. But uh, it was a pretty cool moment. And this team – pretty close and you know Spencer Johnson being the oldest player in college basketball it's only fitting that he is now a father uh, as the oldest player in college basketball so congrats to him and Izzy on welcoming little Joey Johnson into the world new fathers our new parents for uh, Izzy and Spencer Johnson we got to take our first time out though on the other side we'll get to the question of the day what needs to happen for BYU to upset number seven Kansas tomorrow night at Allen Fieldhouse we'll take your calls 801-575-8255 it's Cougar Nation here on KSL News Radio.